Now, I want to talk a little bit today about everyday carry. Now, most everyday carry videos are about what you carry around with you in your pockets. And for me, that's pretty straightforward. A set of keys, a Leatherman Wave, and a cheap $3 flashlight that uses a single AA battery. Now you know my everyday carry. But what I want to talk about is everyday carry for my truck. Now I recently upgraded my pickup truck. I went from a 2004 Chevy to a 2008 Ford four-wheel drive. I like the Ford better. It is newer, it has fewer miles, and it does have four-wheel drive. But there's a problem. Everywhere I go, I take with me this tool satchel and a few extra things. And it lived under the back seat of the extended cab Chevy pickup. Now the back seat on the Ford is about three inches shallower than the back seat on the Chevy. So this tool tote will not fit. So either I can, you know, hack out the floor pan and try to fabricate a newer, deeper floor pan and, and increase the space under that back seat. But I think that's going a little bit too far, even for me. So rather than hacking up the truck, I'm going to hack what I carry and how I carry it every day. So back to everyday carry. What is here and why do I carry it? In a perfect world, I would take all of my tools everywhere I go. But that's not practical, at least for me. What you see before you are the kinds of tools that I have found through the years that would have saved me a trip home or a trip to the hardware store if only I had had it with me. So this represents what I believe to be the best trade-off between the minimum amount that I can carry while giving me the maximum versatility of what I can accomplish. If I were going to do a plumbing job, then I would bring my plumbing tools and so on with electric work, woodwork, carpentry, and automotive work. If I know what I'm going to do, I bring the appropriate tools to do it. But this collection in a minimum of space gives me the maximum versatility of being able to accomplish whatever I come across. It may not be the fastest way to do a particular job. It may not be even the best way to do a particular job. But most things I encounter on a routine basis, I can accomplish with this group of tools. First of all is a cordless drill. I do not know how mankind survived without cordless drills. I have a lot of cordless tools and they're great and whatever, but the cordless drill is the king of them all. It can drill holes, it can drive screws. And just a little aside here, yes, I have a, a quarter inch impact driver, but I don't use my impact driver to drive screws. I know that makes me a heathen and that I ought to be ashamed of myself for using a drill to drive screws, but I like using a drill to drive screws. I'm good at it. And rather than carrying a whole separate tool that makes a lot of ugly clatter noise, why not just use the tool that I have? Now, in my drill in particular, I keep this chucked up at all times, which is a DeWalt flip driver. It has a eighth inch drill bit with a countersink on one side and then flip it over, and it's a magnetic quarter inch slot. Uh, and in my case, it almost always holds a number two Phillips. This goes with me everywhere I go. I, it's, I use this tool probably more than any other tool. However, to extend the range of this tool, we have this. I got this for Christmas 10, 12 years ago, maybe 15, and I've never seen its equal before or since. And what it is in a single roll-up tool pouch is a broad range of drilling and driving tools. Uh, standard high-speed steel drill bits up to a quarter inch, masonry bits up to a half inch, some nut drivers, hex drivers, Phillips square, flathead, Torx. I don't use the spur tip bits very much and I don't often have a case to use the spade bits but being able to drill a one inch hole in a two by four on a moment's notice is a handy capability to have. Speaking of cordless screw gun, what good is a screw gun without screws? This is an assortment of screws that goes with me everywhere. 
two inch drywall screws, inch and a quarter, three and a half, whatever those are, uh, some nails, and then these are just kind of, uh, this is random hardware that gets collected from various jobs that I do. You know, the kind of a, of a magic case that um, whatever screw you need, there's a pretty good chance it's in here somewhere, not by intention, just the way it turns out. Another small compact tool set that I have found has saved my life on many occasions is a quarter inch socket set. Full range of standard and metric, shallow and deep, couple of extensions. You know, having this all in one case, uh, it's just incredibly useful. A lot of times, you take the extension and you hook it up to a quarter inch socket and now you have extended your ability to drive a quarter inch, you know, tool bit. Uh, so you need to reach a Torx screw that's down in a hole, put a quarter inch socket on here, put the Torx bit from here and here, and then you can get what you need. It works well in conjunction with the other tools, is the point. Moving on, going across here, a combination square, 16 inch combination square. Obviously it's a square, but it's also a 16 inch straight edge. Comes in handy a lot of times. A couple of clamps. To hold the work still while you're working on it to compress something you just never know for a small tool footprint they add a lot of versatility 25 foot tape measure with a magnetic tip these days uh, it seems like tape measures uh, prove that they're better by having a bigger case they haven't made the tape any bigger they haven't made the tape any longer meaningfully I mean maybe you can get a 30 foot this is a 25 whatever but they've just they've made this case huge and fat and I don't really understand that I I mean I guess if I were six foot eight and if I were Andre the Giant I'd want a bigger tape measure this might be too small for my little fingers to get a hold of but otherwise there is no benefit to making a huge fat case to go around the same size tape that it doesn't make any sense to me so anyway I really like this particular form factor of this Comalon it does have the, the ruggedized you know, rubber coating. It holds up to drops pretty well. And it fits in a, in a tool apron. If you are wearing a, a framing tool apron, this actually fits in the pouch, which you know, is remarkable considering that most new tape measures don't. I have two or three of these. I actually have to track them down over the web and special order them. But to me, this tape measure is just right. It's the right size, the right length, and the magnetic tip does me a lot of good of being able to measure against things made of metal. Couple pairs of uh, what I would call a channel lock. I don't know, I don't know the official term for it. Obviously, channel lock is a brand name. These are actually a knockoff of a Nipex. I picked them up at Tractor Supply. You change the, uh, the opening by pushing this button and it, and it has more opening settings than, a, than real channel locks would. So, a, you know, a larger and a smaller. Those are pretty handy. Lineman's pliers. I really like my lineman's pliers to have the crimping lug right here. Um, you know, for, for crimping on a, a terminal end. Um, obviously a big cutting thing. Obviously a big flat for, for twisting and that. This particular pair is a cheapo set from Harbor Freight a while back. You know, that's kind of my favorite pair of lineman's pliers. Phillips and standard screwdrivers, biggish and smallish. This one, frankly, is more of a prying tool than it is a screwdriver, but I do keep the tip in decent condition. This multi-purpose painter's tool, you know, is sold to be able to clean rollers and blah, blah, blah. What I end up doing with it most of the time is using this fairly sharp scraping edge and this fairly sharp scraping corner scraping off gaskets, uh, digging out a groove in something using this corner. Uh, it's just a really handy tool to have on hand. You can also do a little spackling with it or, or whatever. Or I have, I have cleaned a roller with it a time or two, but that's not usually what happens. 16 ounce Craftsman curved claw hammer. Sometimes I carry a straight claw hammer. I'm, I'm relatively agnostic about that. At the moment, this curved claw is the one that's in the, in the bag. You just need a hammer, and uh, this is kind of a all-around jack-of-trades kind of a hammer. A decent torpedo level. This one's a little bigger than most torpedo levels. It does have magnetic tips, which is really handy for doing any kind of work with pipes. 
and it has the uh, gradations for if you need to do your run for plumbing you know quarter inch per foot or whatever and so that's a that's a handy feature to have on it a multimeter I choose this meter because it's uh, small in size because it has the amperage reading so if you're going to be you know checking out a compressor on an air conditioner or some kind of a thing this will display the amperage going through the various legs and this particular one also has a non-contact voltage sensor and I find that really handy for tracing a wire or or you know before you actually begin working on something kind of give it that very final is there any voltage there that you can sense as always before I ever trust it I hold it up to a known live wire and confirm that it beeps at me that the meter is working I have in the past almost gotten burned on holding a meter up to something the meter says it's dead and then come to find out it was live and the meter just wasn't working so I've learned the hard way not to have that problem anymore a set of small picks a, a small punch uh, what's missing here is I normally keep a nail set with me I'm gonna have to go find it but next to this goes a nail set a four in hand file it's a rasp it's a file it's both flat and curved just a lot of times you need to take a little something off of something and that's a handy tool to have. Wood chisel, a th this is a three quarter, a half inch, and an inch and a half. You know, there again, these are not for fine woodworking, but if you need to remove a little bit of wood or a little bit of a, of a soft material, these will do a fine job of it. I keep them sharp-ish. They're not, you know, so dull as to be useless. But I have a fine set of chisels that's over in my fine woodworking toolbox. Wire strippers, if you're like me, you can strip copper wire of almost any size using a Leatherman tool or your teeth depending on how small the wire is but this really speeds things up and to me it, it earns its keep if I need to do any meaningful wiring work. Needle nose pliers, tiny needle nose pliers, side cutting pliers, fairly self-explanatory. I probably could live without these side cutting pliers. They're, the, the lineman's pliers are doing almost the same job but there's a lot of times where you need to kind of reach in and get a hold of a wire that's that's up against a face where you don't have room for the jaws to get past the wire. So if you need to reach into something and snip something, that's where these come in handy. 10 inch crescent wrench. This one's a Craftsman brand. I'm fairly agnostic on brands as long as it's not just junk. There's just times where, you know, channel locks can turn a bolt and a nut a lot of times. This set goes up to a half an inch. So, you know, for most things a half an inch and smaller, I would reach in here and use this. But there's just times where you need to turn a nut or a bolt cleanly. You don't want to scar it all up with channel locks. And that's where a crescent wrench comes in handy. Vice grips. I use these vice grips more like a clamp than anything else. Uh, usually these are being used to hold something still, to hold something together. But, you know, vice grips are so universal that there again they've earned their place in the tool pouch both standard and needle nose then we have a set of um, allen wrenches well torx and then standard allen and then metric allen wrenches fairly self-explanatory razor scraper uh, black tape long reach drill bit so a lot of times I have found that you need to drill especially if you're running a wire if you're running plumbing if you're that you need to drill deeper than a standard you know jobber length drill bit will go so I carry these three with me and, and there again they can do the majority of what I come across a couple of bimetal reciprocating saw blades now I don't carry a reciprocating saw with me these blades are not to be used in a saw these represent essentially a drywall jab saw that I carry with me everywhere I go. And to use it, you take the saw blade holder and you clamp the saw blade in it and you jab. Now, for a while, I carried with me a handle designed to grip one of these saw blades and that gave me a jab saw by means of the handle. But the handle is pretty large and pretty heavy. And there again, I'm trying to get to the minimum. And for the two times a year that I need to use either of these saws, you know, holding it with vice grips is just as good to me as holding it with a handle. 
couple of marking tools, a pencil and a Sharpie, a single pair of straight cut tin snips. There again, if I needed to do a lot of tin work, I have left and right cut, I have offset left and right cut, I have uh, electric tin snips, I have a plasma cutter. I mean, you know, we can go on up the range of ways to cut steel, but these are tin snips, these are heavy duty scissors, they can cut rope, they can cut canvas. They're just a handy thing to have with you. And closing in on the end, we have number one Flathead and Phillips, which are separated from these. You'll see why in about two seconds. And finally, a sailing knife. Now, these are all the things that I need to bring with me. These things can just sit in the free space under the seat. There's a nice spot for them. I don't really need to worry about those. But all of these things, which used to live in this tool pouch, need to go with me. Now, these larger flat tools just went in the big bucket, and you can reach in here and you can see what's in there. And it's not hard to pull out the big torpedo level, or a flathead screwdriver, or a tape measure. But these smaller items, things like these, these used to go in these side pockets. And so I had a single pocket, out of which we're sticking plier handles. And I knew if I need a pair of pliers, you can reach over there and grab them. Now, my new space is three inches lower, so this kind of uh, tool organization isn't going to work. Now it turns out that I have this nice, basically, canvas tool bag. This uh, actually held a quarter cable oscillating multi-tool and it is just the right dimensions for the space that I have under the seat. Being flexible and floppy, it will go to whatever shape that I ask it to go. So this is actually pretty great. For larger items, hammers and levels and these big screwdrivers and that, they can just go right in this opening and we can see them and we can pull them out at will. But the smaller items turn out to be a problem. If I throw these little sharp picks, or these uh, wood chisels, or these drill bits down in that bag, I am not going to be able to find them. It's going to be just a jumbled mess, and there's a pretty good chance that you're going to pull back a bleeding finger after you root around in there and get stabbed by a pick or cut by a wood chisel. So what we're going to be creating is a tool roll-up pouch. The same idea as this here that it's a roll-up canvas pouch that has an assigned slot for each of the tools. So you'll notice that I have these tools laid out very carefully and very methodically. I have them laid out in these nice neat rows and this distance is exactly 16 inches high. So our tool pouch, it turns out, is going to be 30 inches wide and 16 inches high and it's going to have a slot for each of these tools. The pouch is going to be made of heavy canvas. I have a big piece of it, I have a big roll of it actually, that a six foot wide roll that I picked up at a thrift store for about five dollars. Best bargain ever. But it can be bought at almost any fabric store for ten dollars a yard or something to that effect. And the heavy canvas has enough body to kind of hold still the fabric needs some of its own weight and body so as to not be floppy in your hand. It needs to be fairly stiff. So the canvas has that stiffness that we're going to need. And then I have gone through and measured exact distances using this left edge as the beginning. The distances of where to lay out to put pockets and loops of elastic that will hold each of these tools in their proper place. So next we're going to head upstairs and go through the process of putting together this canvas roll-up for our everyday carry. So here we are in the sewing room and I have gone through and cut out the various pockets that will be attached to the sheet. I've gone through and cut out the edging to go along the edge of the pockets to uh, give them a, a finished edge and to give them some wear protection. So edging for each of the pockets. 
I've gone through and cut out the edging to go around the perimeter of the whole tool roll. And you'll notice that this has been cut on the bias. And for those of you not familiar, the idea of cutting on the bias is fabric is woven horizontally and vertically intersecting threads. And for edging in particular, it is much more helpful if the threads are not running in parallel with the edge itself because otherwise the threads tend to spread and separate along that crease. Now with something like this heavy canvas uh, it's probably not too much of a problem but it's just a good practice anytime you're making edge banding out of cloth to cut it at this 45 degree angle and it's just going to make it stronger and wear better. Have some Velcro. Have this one inch elastic. This is obviously going to be the key in holding these various things in place. And finally, we have the actual main fabric of the tool roll. So what I have done is with the tools all laid out on the table saw downstairs, I simply took a tape measure. I set the table saw fence to what I imagine to be this edge of the fabric. And then just with the tools laid out, just went through and measured each point that I think that the elastic should be sewn to the fabric to, to provide the proper loop. And just went through and annotated everywhere that there should be a seam on this fabric. And then just wrote it down with, you know, chicken scratch notation. Then, you know, most of the time with a project like this, I would go ahead and take these kind of chicken scratch kind of notes and then produce a CAD drawing to work from, complete with measurements, etc., etc. But in this case, we are literally working from a blank canvas. <laughs> it's a blank canvas. Never mind. So it just made more sense to just take my chicken scratch notes and go through with a pencil and just put the actual markings on this piece of fabric itself and then I will just you know work from there. So each of these lines for instance represent where there will be a pocket to hold one of the Allen wrench sets standard metric and Torx or whatever. These lines represent where there will be a larger pocket to hold drill bits, pencils, you know long tubular things. And then these lines uh, is where there will be this one inch elastic and then I will sew the elastic down at, at each of these line markings and that will hopefully produce a loop appropriate to hold down whatever tool. So the first thing will be to simply get these dressed out with the edging that they need and then sew them in place as indicated here on the sheet to slip the tool handles or whatever under so, since I have the resource, I might as well use it. <clears throat> so here is one of the pockets, here is the edge turned under. And we will sew a straight seam across here to make the edge hold still. Since I have a serger, there's no reason not to run this through the serger to bind this inside seam that will be turned under and that will just help to prevent this from fraying as this thing is used through the years. It's an unconventional way of doing it for this kind of uh, construction, this kind of product, but it'll make it better than it otherwise would have been. The nice thing about these sergers is that they have this cutting knife. So as I run this through, it's actually going to trim it a little bit and and surge perfectly up against the edge of it. So there's that edge bound to keep these threads from getting away and then we will just put this in the standard sewing machine and put a seam across here to lock the fold in place. So now each of those are ready to be sewn down in preparation for being attached. So now starting with this pocket that will be in this 
upper right corner, these outer edges will be secured by the outer binding. So really the only edge we need to secure is right here. So we will do that by putting it face down so that it's face to face. And then we will sew through the half inch seam allowance and fold it back over. Then we'll sew at each of these indicated lines. But these outer parts we won't actually do until it gets bound together. Uh, in a perfect world, certainly if I were in a sewing class, I would tell you to pin this in place and maybe even draw a line of where you intend to sew. I'm just going to roll with it. Now right here, I will be sure to sew backward to lock that. So now fold this over. There's what will be visible on the outside. That's not too bad looking, fairly consistent. All right, so that piece is done. Bisect this. To join these uh, these edge bandings, you put face to face together. But then, and I, I know it's a little counterintuitive, but that's when this folds over. Understand it will go like that. But if I do it here, then I I have also offset it. So what I have to actually do is slide it sideways to where the seam itself is going to go right through that little gap right there. And then when you sew right through that seam, when you sew right through those gaps, then when you unfold it, you get a straight result. So I'll go through and join all these together into one long strip and then we'll come back and apply it. So for these seams, I am, you know, this is the upside down side. I am stretching them out and ironing them open and then trimming, you know, the overhang. The idea that you want to open them up flat is to limit how many layers of fabric you go through at one time with the needle. So I've now gone through and sewn them all together and then folded and ironed it into its final form of this edge banding. We simply wrap this edge as deep up into that crease as we can get it. I'm not beginning at the very, very edge of this banding because I need to splice the new piece in when I get around here. So I'm actually beginning two or three inches back. So here it is, rolled up full of tools. And it becomes clear that I need to put Velcro. So Velcro there, and then Velcro here, centered on this seam. And then, looking at it with the tools installed, I see I need to make a couple tweaks. I don't have anything currently to hold these pliers in, so I'm going to put a stretch of elastic hopping here, going up here, and then tying in this and this, which will make these things a little more secure. One of the things you may realize is that I've left clear channels of canvas between these vertical lines. If you, you know, it, 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 it's exaggerated, but if I put that wrench in like that, then this thing cannot roll up. It's important to leave it in these vertical rows of tools so that it can roll. And here it is in its finished form. The extra pockets I added, the extra elastic to tie down this stuff in the middle. 
So, let's see about putting it together. And there you have it. Nice custom tool roll for the exactly the tools I want, for the exactly the application I want. And as always, thanks for watching.